Welcome to Middle School Science Module 9, The History of the Planet Earth. This module is a partnership with TLC Tutoring Company and Arkansas State University. Let's begin with historical geology. This is the study of changes in Earth and its life forms over time. This comes into several different parts that fall into historical geology. So first is uniformitarianism, which is quite a word, but that states that the processes that alter the Earth's crust are the same processes that occurred millions of years ago, that the way the Earth runs now is basically how the Earth ran before. Original horizontality states that the sediment is deposited horizontally, that layers go on top of layers left to right horizontally. Superposition. This states that the sequence of rocks in their original orientation will have the oldest rock on the bottom and the youngest rock on top. And finally, cross-cutting relationships. A rock must already be in place to be cut by a fault, igneous intrusion, or erosion. Using this information can help place time at a cer on certain features. Now, the geological time scale is a system of chronological dating that classifies geolo geological layers or strata or strat stratigraphy in time. Now, you can see this diagram on the right it shows a typical geological time scale showing the major areas, periods in our planet's history. <clears throat> you can see, you know, Archean, Proterozoic, you have the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. And in between those major eras, you have these extinction events. Using these layers, you can observe volcanic eruptions, glaciation, asteroid impacts, extinction events, and more that are all illustrated using this time scale. Now, geological dating really has two ways that we try to date something. Uh, one is just relative dating. This dating technique allows for identifying the sequential order of geological events, one relative to the other. So, again, with the layers, this is based on the concept, in a normal sequence, the deepest layers are also the oldest. If something is found in a layer that is known to be a certain age, then the specimen should be around the same general age. And then there is also what we would call absolute dating. This is sometimes radiometric dating, type of dating which is based off the measurement of the contact content of specific radioactive isotopes, of which the half-life is one. So, uh, carbon-14 degrades about by half every 5,730 years, and it's very consistent. So by measuring the amount of carbon-14 present, the age of the sample can be calculated. Now, within the Earth, there are three major rock types. And first is the igneous, or magmatic rock, which is formed through the cooling and solidification of magma or lava. Second is sedimentary rock, formed by the accumulation or deposition of mineral and organic particles at the Earth's surface, which then hardens to stone. Metamorphic rock is, arises from the transformation of existing rock to new types, usually in a process called metamorphism. This can be accomplished by exposing the original rock to high pressures and temperatures, which reforms the rock into metamorphic rock. Now, since all rock is essentially made of the same materials, rock materials move through the rock cycle. So you can see here, if we start with, say, magma, it cools and becomes igneous. It becomes weathered and turns into sediment, which then layers and compacts and makes sedimentary rock, then goes through heat and pressure and becomes metamorphic rock. Then it melts and it becomes magma. And you can see all of these flow into each other. And Stone and rock is just flowing through this cycle all throughout the Earth. Now, a mineral or a mineral species is a solid chemical compound with fairly well-defined chemical composition and a specific crystal structure that occurs naturally in a pure form. Minerals can be classified using many of their properties. So here's just a few options you can consider. So there's the physical color. You know, is it green? Is it blue? Is it red? Uh, its crystal type, is it cubic, prismatic, amorphous? Uh, what's its hardness? This is usually results of a scratch test from very soft, like talc powder, to diamond, which is a full 10. Next would be luster, the way the mineral reflects light, its shininess. Its density, which can go anywhere from about 1 gram per cubic centimeter, which is about the density of water, all the way up to 17.5 grams per cubic centimeter, which is very dense and heavy. 
And then cleavage and fracture, which is the way the mineral reacts to being struck by a hammer or other device. How it breaks and how it cracks is a prediction of the type of mineral it is. Erosion is the action of surface processes, such as water flow or wind, that remove soil, rock, or dissolved material from one location on the Earth's crust and transports it to another location. So physical erosion is the breakdown of rocks through mechanical effects, you know, heat and water and ice and other agents like that. We also have chemical erosion, which is a chemical reaction of water and atmospheric gases with rocks and soils. Then these agents of erosion might be wind and water, glaciers, gravity. There's lots of things that can cause erosion to happen. Now, deposition is kind of the opposite of erosion. If something is eroded, sooner or later it lays down and settles at when the eroded material finds a place. So as water slows down or wind slows down, it has less energy and can hold less sediment, which can result in some of the sediment being deposited. Sediment is deposited in locations called depositional environments, such as swamps, deltas, beaches, and the ocean floor. High energy environments, like rushing rivers and ocean shores with large waves, are those in which sediment is transported and deposited quickly. And small grains of sediment are often deposited in low energy environments, like deep lakes, areas of slow moving air, and swamps. Sediment deposited in water typically forms layers called beds. Now, weathering is the breaking down of rocks, soils, and minerals, as well as wood and artificial through contact with water, atmospheric gases, or biological organism. Now, this happens in place as opposed to erosion, which involves transport. So again, there's physical weathering, which is the breakdown from heat and water and ice, and chemical weathering, which is chemical reactions and atmospheric gases. This also has biological weathering, which is chemical weathering due to the activities of biological organisms. So this would be human-centered effects or just biological impacts. Now, these landforms that concern can form because of erosion and deposition, uh, we end up with some very interesting landforms. So, there are often tall, jagged structures with several exposed layers of rock. Along the U.S. coast, coastal erosions change the size and the shape of the beaches. The teepees, pictured here, of the painted desert in Arizona were formed after erosion wore away parts of the land, leaving behind these multicolored mounds. Landforms created by deposition are usually flat and low-lying. Wind deposition can gradually form deserts of sand. Deposition also occurs where mountain streams reach the gentle slopes of wide, flat valleys. Deposition along a riverbed occurs when the speed of the water slows down and it results in a sandbar. An apron of sediment, called an alluvial fan, like is pictured here, often forms where a stream flows from a steep, narrow canyon into a flat plain at the foot of a mountain. Glacial erosion also has unique landforms. It can produce ice-carved features in mountains like jagged mountain peaks and U-shaped valleys, such as these in Glacier National Park. The sides of the U-shaped valleys are steep and the bottom of the valley is very flat. Currents and waves constantly cause coastal erosion. This can be due to waves which carve out caves, pillars, and arches in rock. Acidic water can carve out spaces in underground rock, forming caves. And a delta is a large deposit of sediment that forms where a stream enters a large body of water, and a dune is a pile of wind-blown sand, like pictured here. Mass wasting is the downhill movement of a large mass of rocks or soil. Mass wasting com commonly occurs when soil on a hillside is soaked with rainwater. A landslide is usually described as a rapid downhill movement of soil, loose rock, and boulders. The two major types are a rockfall and a mudslide. And a mudslide is when the water-soaked soil gets very heavy and starts to slide. Human activity, such as removing vegetation, can affect both the severity of mass wasting and the tendency for it to occur. However, landscaping and retaining walls can, in contrast, help stop potential landslides. Now, geologists have two main types of evidence to learn about the Earth's interior. There's direct evidence, so that's rocks that can be drilled from deep inside the Earth. 
And then there's much more indirect evidence from seismic waves produced by earthquakes that allow scientists to measure the speed in which they travel. There are three main layers of the Earth, which vary greatly in size, composition, temperature, and pressure. The first layer, the outer layer, is the crust. This is a layer of solid rock that forms the Earth's outer skin. This includes both dry land and the ocean floor. Oceanic crusts are mostly basalt, but continental crust, the crust that forms the continents, is mostly made of granite. The next layer is the mantle. This is a layer of solid, hot rock about 40 kilometers beneath the surface. It's divided into three sublayers: the lithosphere, the uppermost part of the mantle, and the crust for a ridge layer about 100 kilometers thick. Tectonic plates sit in the, lith the lithosphere. Then the athenosphere is the softer part of the mantle below the lithosphere, which is hotter and under increased pressure. And then the lower mantle is the solid material extending all the way to the Earth's core. Now the core itself is mostly made of metals, iron and nickel. It has two parts, an outer core, which is a layer of molten metal, and it surrounds an inner core, which is a dense ball of solid metal. Movement of the liquid outer core is what creates the Earth's magnetic field. Now recall that heat is transferred by conduction, direct contact, convection, flowing fluids, and radiation, transferred through empty space. Convection currents flow in the mantle. The heat source is the Earth's core and from the mantle itself. As you can see here, you've got currents of convection carrying heat up through the, through the, uh, through the mantle itself. These currents have been acting like a conveyor belt, moving the lithosphere above for the past 4 billion years. Now, Alfred Wegener hypothesized at one time that all the continents were once joined together in a single landmass that he named Pangaea, and have since drifted apart, and this is now known as continental drift. Evidence that supported this hypothesis is land features such as mountain ranges lining up on continents when pieced together. You know, the, the most obvious one is probably how uh, India fits up against Africa. Evidence from fossils or traces from ancient organisms preserved in rock show the same animals and plants occurred in the now separated land masses. And then evidence from climate change where scratches on rocks were made from glaciers in places with much more mild climates today. Now, the theory of plate tectonics builds on the concept of continental drift. It basically is made of these components, that the plates, the, plate, the tectonic plates, float on top of the athenosphere. Convection currents rise in the athenosphere and spread out beneath the lithosphere. The convection currents cause the plates to move, producing changes in the Earth's surface. Changes in the Earth's surface include volcanoes, mountain ranges, and deep ocean trenches. The edges of the place meet at lines called plate boundaries, and when rocks slip past each other along these boundaries, faults or breaks in the Earth's crust appear. Now there are several specific concepts dealing with plate tectonics. So the first is the transform boundary. So you can see where a place where two plates slip past each other, moving in opposite directions, and you'll have frequent earthquakes here, earthquakes here because of the friction. Then you can have a divergent boundary where two plates move apart or diverge. That Usually this occurs at a mid-ocean ridge. And then a rift valley is when a deep valley is formed along a divergent boundary that develops on land. Then a convergent boundary is a place where two plates come together or converge, causing a collision. When two plates of oceanic crust collide, or when an oceanic plate collides with a continental plate, one plate is subducted beneath the other to form a trench, and when two continental plates collide, they form mountains. And that completes Middle School Science Module 9. Module 10 will cover the roles of water in Earth's surface processes. Thank you very much.